Okay, so um, we're here with uh, our compañera Margaret Flowers. Um, first of all, Margaret, I'd, I'd like to express our thanks and admiration to you um, and all your colleagues that took part, the three colleagues that took part in the defense of the Venezuelan embassy in Washington, because that was such a great example, a great inspirational example to so many of us. Thank you. Well, you know, it was much more than just the four of us. It was hundreds of people inside and outside the embassy that made that possible. Right. Um, and also, I'd like to express uh, uh, very much my, my personal thanks and admiration to, to you and to your late partner, Kevin, for the tremendous work that you've done over so many years. And thank you, too, for continuing to do so. So um, we're very lucky to be able to interview you um, because you're here on a delegation uh, to, to Nicaragua. Perhaps you could explain a little bit about what the purpose of the delegation is. Sure, thank you. And thank you for coming today to, to interview me. It's great to meet you. Um, so the delegation is sponsored by a coalition that was formed at the end of 2019 in the United States called Sanctions Kill, and also in conjunction with the Friends of the ATC, the Rural Workers Movement Association here in Nicaragua. And through Sanctions Kill, we're trying to educate people in the United States about what sanctions are. They're being used more frequently by the United States. They're just as deadly as conventional warfare. And and how that impacts people in the U.S. as well. And we thought that for our first delegation, we wanted to come to Nicaragua because this is a country that's early in the U.S. economic warfare. Um, the NECA Act was just passed in late 2018, and so we wanted to get a sense of what things are like early on before the sanctions have really taken effect as they have in you know, many countries like Cuba and Venezuela. Zimbabwe, Iran, you know, so many places that are really struggling right now because of them. And also just to learn about the resilience, you know, Nicaragua has done so many things to prepare so that it can, you know, despite U.S. economic warfare, can hopefully continue to provide for the basic needs of its people through the food sovereignty, I think is a really huge part of that, and the healthcare infrastructure that exists here. One, one of the things that, um, you mentioned in, before we started uh, recording this uh, interview, Margaret, um, is how over the last few months in particular, um, the people in solidarity with Venezuela, Cuba, Bolivia, Nicaragua, uh, that have been targets of, of, of US aggression in some shape or form, um, have, have, have been able to to start developing work with uh, solidarity, the solidarity movement and the popular movement in the United States. Could you talk to us a little bit about how you, that has developed and how you'd like to see it develop in the future? Yes, well, you know, another concept that's so important is, is how, you know, the importance of, of uh, international solidarity. But as you said, our conversations have been evolving with our international colleagues to recognize that it's not one way, it's bi-directional solidarity. Because, you know, it's important for people in the United States, we live in the country that is targeting and attacking so many other countries. So we have a particular responsibility to address our government and to pressure our government to stop that behavior. But at the same time, we're also struggling with many similar types of situations, not the same severity that we see in the poorer countries, but you know, people in the United States are not able to get health care, they're not able to get housing, education is becoming unaffordable, you know, the economic war abroad is also being waged against people at home, the racism of the U.S. abroad exists at home, the militarization abroad exists at home, and so we also need to be organizing and fighting for our rights and we have so much to learn from people in other countries about how they organize, how they resisted, how they prepared themselves, how they protected themselves, as well as what the possibilities are. People in the United States, many people don't even have a sense of what the possibilities are. They don't even 
have a concept of what it's like to get health care without having to worry about whether you can pay for it, about being able to get a college education without having to save up your entire life or put yourself into like massive debt, or the right to housing. You know, many of these things are, you know, a life with dignity. This is, these are just concepts that many people don't have experience with. And so we've been doing webinars, um, bilingual webinars, and we're trying more and more to bring social movements in the U.S. together with social movements in other countries so we can start to build these relationships and share this knowledge. One of the things that we also um, touched on before the interview was how difficult it is for people here to understand how people in the United States see things. And, how, and conversely, how difficult it is for people in the United States, even people who, who, who of, of great goodwill, um, to uh, understand how we see things here in Nicaragua. And do, do you have any observations in relation to that? I feel like there's so many things that could be said about that. I mean, um, one thing is just the for people in the United States... Um, there's so much misinformation in the United States, and I think that's one reason why it's so important for these, these delegations to occur. And I'm really happy that we have a lot of young people that came on this delegation, because coming to a country and seeing it with your own eyes makes it so clear that what we're being told in the corporate media in the United States is just completely false. And so, you know, that's really eye-opening. But, you know, people in the U.S., they're just told this narrative, this pro-imperialist, racist, white supremacist narrative, and they, many people don't see alternatives, alternative media. They don't recognize that, that what they're being told is, is lies. So I think the media is a really important part of this, but also the whole, the whole idea of American exceptionalism and white supremacy is so ingrained in the society in the, in the United States that I think people don't see it. It's like, we think of it as like being a fish in water. You don't know anything but water. And so people who haven't been exposed to other places, other ideas, they don't recognize how, and it, this applies to progressives as well, you know, progressives that will support things like humanitarian war or, or the responsibility to protect all these things that we're told in the United States. And so they consider themselves progressive, but they find themselves supporting U.S. economic wars or attacks uh, or threats of attacks, you know, on target targeted countries around the world. So I, I think that's another piece of it. And, you know, and I wonder for people in Nicaragua, well, I guess, you know, I, I can't speak at all to what people in Nicaragua think, but uh, I do find a big difference when I've traveled in Venezuela and here in Nicaragua, just in kind of the level of political education. I think coming from countries that have experienced revolutions and, and have a clear understanding of, you know, what is neoliberalism. I mean, the United States, a lot of times we're told, don't even use the word neoliberalism because it as liberal in it, it's confusing to people. You know, but here, you know, in the Latin American countries where people have been victims of this neoliberal capitalism, they really understand very clearly what that is and why they don't want to exist in that system and then have an understanding of what it takes to build a socialized system. Because I, you know, we so often see socialists in the United States who have this kind of theoretical purity and so they, you know, critique other countries' socialist processes without recognizing that you don't just snap your fingers and socialism appears. It's something that has variations for different countries. It's a process. It's something you're always building, something you're always protecting. So I think, you know, people in the U.S. just don't have this knowledge and this experience, which is why it's so important that we have these interchanges and that we, you know, learn these things. So, Margaret, can, is it possible for you to talk to us a bit about what has been most striking for you um, and that you feel that may have either changed your mind about things or informed you about something that you weren't aware of before? And is it possible to give us your... I guess I'm just, I'm most intrigued here in 
because I'm constantly thinking and we're constantly thinking at Popular Resistance about, you know, how do we build this popular resistance in the United States? How do we build this mass movement that's politically educated, that is clear about what its goals are, that understands how social transformation occurs, that understands what obstacles you're going to be coming up against, and, you know, how we can be effective. So I'm so interested in learning how the Sandinista Revolution, you know, how it was organized, the different roles that were played. You know, you've got the, the ATC, the, uh, the Rural Workers Association, and how that was forming at the same time as the Sandinista Front, and how they, you know, complemented each other, and, you know, how poor workers around the country were able to mobilize and play a very critical role in that, in that revolution in defending their land and making sure that there was food and the role that women played in the movement. And then, you know, the, how difficult it must have been during that neoliberal period in 1990 to 2006 where you're saying, okay, we built this thing, we built this, trying to create this democratic society, and now that the democratic society has brought into power these neoliberal leaders and, you know, but continued to keep that struggle going through that difficult period. And then now, you know, so many gains that have been achieved while well, there's still so much more to do and resisting what the United States is trying to do with the 2018 coup attempt. And, you know, we know with the elections coming up in November of this year, already there are signs that the U.S. is going to be meddling in that and, and, you know, that could be difficult. So I just think there are so many lessons here and I've met so many incredible people that have been a part of that and I just... There's so much more, you know, to learn. So much, there's so much depth there. Um, during your visit, you, uh, I understand you were able to get over to uh, the regional capital of Nicaragua's northern Caribbean region, mm -hmm. um, a city called Bilwi that in Spanish used to be called Puerto Cabezas. In fact, mm -hmm. a lot of people still refer to it as Puerto Cabezas. Mm -hmm. um, did, 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 was there anything in, in, in your visit there that might be relevant to the issue of race and indigenous peoples um, in the United States? I'm with oh, absolutely. Yeah, so, um, you know, the autonomous region. And um, not only did we meet with the governor, Carlos Alamon, but we also met with professors at Uricon, the university that is there. and. Um, and I had the same thoughts when we were there that, you know, we have in the United States an indigenous population that continues to exist and actually some gains have been made in getting land back to some of the indigenous peoples in the United States. There have been very, a few very small victories over the recent years. Uh, but the model that we see here of, you know, a period of negotiation and the communities that wanted to have their land, being able to get the title to the, that land, uh, the university making sure that people can get an education, but also grounding that work in indigenous communities, and as they say, trying to rescue the knowledge, really recognizing the wisdom of the elders, and, you know, even the ATC with its school, with its agroecological agro school, is trying to take the indigenous knowledge and the science that has been developed outside of that indigenous and, you know, mesh them into really understanding what are the best practices, uh, what are the best ways to have a sustainable food system. I think these are really models for everywhere in the world to be able to start to uh, I don't even know how to say it because it's, it's bigger than reparations. The harm that is, has been done, we just need a new paradigm of how we recognize the importance of indigenous communities and respect that and, and finally come to terms, you know, with the fact that in the United States, many of us are settlers on this land and how do we really 
finally end this period of settler colonialism in a way that, you know, creates greater equity and, you know, makes, ends this whole period that's been going on now, you know, for hundreds and hundreds of years. Margaret, one of the things, uh, Nicaragua has been in, in the news, perhaps not in the mainstream news, but the, the United Nations recently recognized Nicaragua as the country in the world that has the most, the highest level of political participation of women. And even the World Economic Forum ranks Nicaragua fifth in the world in terms of uh, uh, the, the gender gap. Um, on your visit, have you had a chance to get some appreciation of uh, the role of women in Nicaraguan society and and, and would, is, is there anything that struck you in, in regard to that? Yeah, I mean, even early on, I think it was our first or second day here, we went into Manawa, we went to that, I think it's called the Central Park that's built over what was actually where people were jailed and tortured um, during the Somoza dictatorship. And there was a giant silhouette of Sandino, and the next to that there was this big shape, this kind of sculpture, and I said, oh, what does this symbolize? And they said, well, that symbolizes feminism because that's a core part of the Sandinista, you know, philosophy is feminism, and you see it in the representation of women in the leadership of this country, but I think one of the things that was really striking we spent some time in the home of one of the leaders in the community called La Vergendos and outside of Hinotega where they're growing coffee and cocoa and other things like that. And the daughter of the man who owned the home had uh, gotten a degree in business and had opened her own business. And so I was talking to her about you know, how important that was and how it came through her education, her involvement with like the ATC and the work that they've done to, you know, show women that they have, there are alternatives for them, that they can develop their own economic security, they can have their own self-determination. And, and so she felt, you know, very empowered and, and very happy that she was able to contribute to her family and she had a son and what she would be able to give that son because of her economic security, and so uh, and I thought that was really striking, and, and the, the whole work of the ATC just to, it's not, a big part of their political education is the empowerment of women, and I know there's also investment in, in women being able to get loans for small businesses and things like that, so it's very intentional, and I think that that's critical. And, I, and so many people will tell you, that at least people I've met, when they, they talk about the revolutionary period, just the critical role that women played in that and how the revolution couldn't have been successful without the leadership of women. Right. Um, Margaret, I mean, perhaps some, we can make this the, 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 the last question, um, unless you have other things that you, you'd like to mention. But one of the things that there was a lot of in my opinion, misplaced optimism, the, the foreign policy towards Latin America and the Caribbean of the uh, new Biden regime um, would be somewhat better than that of the previous regime under President Donald Trump. And do, do you have any thoughts about, uh, do, are there any grounds for optimism at all about the change in the, the administration in the United States as regards foreign policy towards Latin America and the Caribbean? Well, I lived through the Obama years, <laughs> so um, I remember what it was like then when, because we had a person in the White House that progressives, through identity politics or whatever, um, thought was somebody that he wasn't, that he was what we call the more effective evil. Obama was able to get away with things that you know, Bush was not able to get away with because progressives came out and protested Bush, but they made excuses for Obama. And, you know, it was the Obama administration that declared Venezuela a national security threat, which really paved the way for the capital flight and, the, you know, the economic damage that has occurred down there. 
when he did normalize relations with Cuba, that was somewhat positive, but I think that was because he wanted to bring in businesses into Cuba that could profit you know, from, from the economy there. Um, so our fear with, with the Biden administration, which is coming true, is the same thing is happening. That you know, when, when Biden recently bombed Syria, what you saw on social media was progressives saying, oh, how wasn't it great that, you know, Biden bombed Syria and we didn't have to read these awful tweets about it. You know, he did it in such a civil way, you know, literally. So, um, before, you know, we have, we've been writing and, and, and stressing and trying to organize about the fact that we can't let the anti-war, anti-imperialist movement in the United States die under Biden as it really suffered under the Obama administration. But I think anybody who has read any history or spent any time on this earth uh, knows that U.S. foreign policy doesn't change really from administration to administration. And it's just, you know, Trump was clumsy about it. and. Biden is not going to be that clumsy about it. And Obama was very smooth. He was Alfred McCoy, who's a professor that you know writes about U.S. Empire, said Obama was one of three presidents that was able to you know most effective in protecting the U.S. Empire. And uh, so, and if you look at he invited Biden invited Carlos Vecchio, the fake ambassador from Venezuela, to the inauguration. He's backing Joven El Moise in Haiti. Um, so I don't think that we should have any illusions about the United States and its, uh, its attitude towards Latin America. The Monroe Drop Doctrine is very much alive. And that's why it's so exciting what's happening. The revolution here, the, you know, beating the coup in Bolivia, the resistance in Venezuela, although it's so difficult there right now, um, you know, these changes, the, the resistance and resolve of Cuba in standing up to the U.S. imperialism, I think these are all signs of hope and, and important that we support and that we build this solidarity and learn from um, because we have to end this, this Monroe Doctrine and it's really going to take us organizing to do it, no matter who's in the White House. Um, so I, I don't try to think from president to president. I try to take a longer view, and really, I think it, it, we're much more effective when we step out of that whole four-year cycle and really think about how do we build this popular movement through resistance, through the creation of alternatives, to really make you know the, the transformation that we need. And Nicaragua is such a beautiful example of what that looks like in practice. And so it's been really enlightening for me to be down here. And I look forward to continuing to learn more and continuing to work with people here in Nicaragua. Margaret, um, perhaps um, it would be good if you could tell people how they can access the, the really excellent material, the educational and information material that you produce for popular resistance. Could you? Uh, explain to people how they can access your, the, the, the work that you all do at Popular Resistance? Sure. Um, so the website is popularresistance.org. Um, you'll also find us on Twitter and Facebook. We have um, a daily digest. It's free. You can sign up. You'll get an email every morning with a list of articles that were posted the day before. We do a weekly newsletter, which is more of movement analysis. We have a free online uh, school for social transformation. That's eight classes, videos, and written curriculum. Uh, all that is free. Um, and then, you know, we post new articles there every day. We have a podcast called Clearing the Fog. It's a weekly podcast where we, you know, bring people that are involved in resistance, involved in creating new systems, or people who can challenge the dominant narrative that's out there. I think this is. One of, I think, in addition to organizing and providing that political education, I think that one role that popular resistance plays is just trying to correct that misinformation, you know, that's out there. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a tool for the movement, and I hope people will look at it and give feedback and, yeah, find it helpful.